This is the MacBook Pro M5, and depending on who you are, this can either be a super capable machine or a bit of a headache. Apple makes some pretty bold claims in terms of performance in here, which in many cases are impressive. The M5 has the fastest single core performance that I've seen in a laptop, along with a host of other serious gains on paper, but I found the story is much more nuanced than that. While some things work incredibly well on this Mac, it does struggle in certain areas, and after using this as my main machine over the last two weeks, I want to get into where this excels, where it falls short, and who this might actually be for. So with that said, let's get into it. This video is sponsored by Moonlock. Hey everyone, Kyle Erickson here. I've always found Mac product releases to be somewhat confusing because not only do we have all these different Macs and chipsets, but there's a lot of overlap in performance and what you can expect from them. For instance, this 14-inch MacBook Pro M5 is the most affordable Pro MacBook that you can buy from Apple right now, starting at $1599 USD. The models above it are definitely better in a lot of areas, but there are a few spots where this M5 version comes out on top, and I just think it can be hard to understand when to pick the M5 over an M4 Pro or even move down to an M4 Air, so let's dig into what this M5 is really about. Looks wise, it's identical to the Pro MacBooks from the past few years. It has the exact same dimensions and weight, the same number of ports as last year, and the same basic color selection between silver and space black. I chose to get silver instead of space black this year, partially because it stays a bit cleaner, and I also just wanted to switch things up. But there are literally no visible changes on here, and I do think that this design is somewhat disappointing. I'm not so much concerned with the size or anything. If you're looking for something really light and portable, that's what the MacBook Air is for. Where the Pro is geared towards function over form, and I do find this to be more limiting than the models above it in that sense, especially with those ports. Last year, Apple bumped up the MacBook Pro with the M4 Pro and Max chips to Thunderbolt 5, where this M5 is still only at Thunderbolt 4. Version 5 is essentially twice as fast as 4, and while I don't think that the majority of folks will notice any difference there, it does limit what I would consider more pro use cases. The first one that I immediately noticed was when I hooked up the MacBook to my CalDigit TS5 Plus dock. That runs all my external accessories from my monitor and speakers to my portable SSD. And using this LG 6K monitor that I reviewed a couple of weeks back uses up most of the bandwidth here, where you can see speed tests on the attached external SSD are very different with or without the monitor connected. Now, if I hook up the monitor or SSD directly to my machine on one of the other ports or use the HDMI port for the monitor, I don't get that issue at all and I've got the full Thunderbolt 4 speed, but if you do fill up your ports or use some kind of hub or dock, that is something to be aware of. Similarly, you do only have one fan inside of the case instead of the dual fans you get on the more expensive MacBook Pros, which seems like a really odd omission considering it's probably a pretty low cost upgrade and would reduce some of the noise and performance issues that we'll get into in a bit, but to me, those things put a damper on the pro aspect of this laptop. Outside of that, you do get the same great components as other pro models, the six speaker sound system is fantastic and is probably the best out of any laptop outside of the 16 inch model. And of course you get the mini LED ProMotion XDR display that looks outstanding. I honestly don't think that this looks that much different from an OLED panel where you get amazing contrast, deep blacks with absolutely no edge bleed or raised black levels. The color accuracy is also outstanding covering 99% of the P3 gamut. So not only is this fantastic for watching content and general usage, but it's great for doing any color critical work. 
It also gets incredibly bright at up to 1000 nits peak brightness or 1600 nits peak in HDR. So still easily viewable in bright areas or outdoors. And I think the only thing that you need to be aware of with this screen size is if you're working in apps with a lot of windows or panels. If I'm using Final Cut Pro or Xcode, I always find myself having to hide panels that I'm not using, which I'm not sure that you would fully get away from with the 16 inch model. It will be a lot better in that sense, but working on an external monitor is going to serve you best there, and the screen size has been the least of my concern with those apps. The bigger issue for me is with performance, and before we dive into all the details there, you guys often ask me what app I'm using to show my system info, and that is almost always clean my Mac, and the team behind that product also makes a fantastic app called Moonlock, who is the sponsor of this week's video. Moonlock is a protection and antivirus app built specifically for Macs that's made to work with Apple's built-in protections. And I love how clean the UI is. It's easy to understand what's going on at a glance and you get a clear picture of your protection level along with simple actionable suggestions for tightening up anything that looks off. You can run scans with the malware scanner and if anything is found, detection history keeps it quarantined so you can review and remove it. There's also a scan planner so you can set automatic checkups and not have to think about it. You can check system settings for potential vulnerabilities. Use the built-in VPN to encrypt browsing and even block your Mac from connecting to certain regions for extra control. It's just a clean and intuitive approach to security that takes any stress out of it and Moonlock will give you 10% off through the link below. So be sure to check that out if you're interested. Now let's get into the finer details with performance. This is the base model MacBook Pro with 16 gigs of RAM and a 512 gig SSD. And the M5 in here has a 10 core CPU and 10 core GPU, just like the M4 version from last year. But on paper performance is a noticeable increase with 14 to 18% faster CPU benchmark scores, 24 to 28% better GPU performance, and and just like the iPad Pro M5 that I looked at last week, the internal SSD speed has basically doubled, but in real world use that only makes a difference in very specific instances. For starters, if all you're doing is browsing the web, doing anything productivity related, or just casually using the M5 MacBook, it's obviously not going to feel any faster where a machine a lot less powerful than this will perform largely the same. Similarly, if I'm focusing on tasks that only rely on the CPU, like coding, this doesn't really feel much different than my M4 Air. I've been using it to work on apps in Xcode and some of my medium-sized web projects that use Docker and Node, and everything runs nice and quick, even with this only having 16 gigs of RAM, which really hasn't been a bottleneck at all in those workflows. Compile times are supposed to be about 1.2 times faster on the M5 over the M4, but unless you're compiling huge code bases, it's probably not going to be perceivable, and I don't do anything too complex with programming these days. I focus more on visually creative workflows now, and with those, the M5 feels smooth to a point. If I'm just editing the odd photo in Lightroom, doing graphic design or light video work, there's virtually no lag. This will be a great machine if that's all you're doing, and it would have served me well while I was working in a simple audio setup in a 4K timeline up until about a year ago. I've since added more tools, and I've been shooting 6K footage at higher bit rates, and when I start doing that or multitasking too much, it does start to bog down. With memory specifically, I find I have to be more aware of what's open and a bit more intentional about how I use it. It's really only an issue on these power hungry apps and something that you could definitely solve by just bumping up the RAM. But in terms of raw processing power, you can only get so far with the M5. Now to its credit, it is quite smooth while working in Final Cut Pro be it on the MacBook screen or connected to that 6K monitor. It's definitely better than my M4 Air, and it's only near the end of my workflow when I start adding film simulation and plugins that my timeline does get pretty choppy. On top of that, rendering speeds on the M5 aren't the fastest either. 
Exporting last week's iPad Pro review takes over 16 minutes on here, which is still heaps faster than my M4 Air that took around 31, but the M4 Pro MacBook Pro crushes it in just under 6 minutes, and that carries over to audio processing as well. The M4 Air takes 98 minutes to render all my vocal plugins on a voiceover, the M5 cuts that to 58, but the M4 Pro only took 38. So if you value your time a lot and you're doing this kind of work, this M5 probably isn't the best choice, but if you're budget strapped and you don't mind a bit of slowness, you can still get a lot done with it. With more GPU focused apps like Blender, you see similar results where render times are in between those two models, but things do feel surprisingly smoother in the viewport versus the M4, which is likely due to the improved ray tracing on this chip and is also reflected in gaming, where Cyberpunk 2077 gets up over 60 FPS at 1080p with dynamic scaling on, which is pretty incredible given this is a base machine. Apple also added neural accelerators to this GPU, which I did briefly talk about last week in my M5 iPad video, and I kind of share the same sentiment here as I did there. Those will give you better AI benchmarks and allow you to run local AI models faster, but even if you max out the configuration on this Mac, the local models that you'll be able to run still probably won't be all that helpful to most people, at least with AI in its current state. The last thing that I want to talk about performance wise is the cooling on the Pro M5 because this thing gets hot, even hotter than the fanless M4 Air and it seems like it doesn't take much to spin up that single fan under load and it might not be the most effective either which isn't great if you're doing a lot of resource heavy work. That being said, if you stick with small to medium sized workloads, it does stay cool and quiet and the battery life is really impressive doing lighter stuff as well. I've been able to casually browse the web, watch content, and use the M5 MacBook as a reference monitor and to play music while I draw. And sticking to those things, it lasts me a couple of days without a charge and is definitely better than my M4 Pro in that sense. When I do start to ramp up that usage, it will suck back the power much faster where rendering audio or video can drain between 1 and 2% a minute, which isn't uncommon for a machine like this, but the nice thing is, it does charge relatively fast, where just like the previous model, I can get to about a 50% charge in a half hour, and I've got the same size battery as the M4 Pro. It also has the exact same wireless connectivity as the M4 model, so no Wi-Fi 7 or Bluetooth 6 this year, but that has been great for me with good speeds and no drops. And for the most part, this has been a decent machine. I just find it to be a little too much of a tweener between the Air and the M4 Pro. You're still going to get the same great hardware that the MacBook Pro M4 Pro has, from the display and speakers to the extra ports and bigger battery, but performance wise, the moment you start to do anything resource heavy on it, the fan really kicks up and you can easily spend twice the amount of time waiting on things to render or even feel some choppiness depending on your workflow. I don't mean to harp on it too much, it's still an incredibly powerful machine. If you're someone who is doing lighter workloads and you just want the better screen and speakers over the air, and you're occasionally delving into more demanding workflows, it will serve you well, but at $1599 USD and over $2000 Canadian, I do think that there is a lot more value in either upgrading to the M4 Pro or down to the M4 Air depending on what your needs are, but with that said, I want to get some input from you guys here. Which one of these three machines would you buy if you had to choose, and also, between the M4 Air and M4 Pro MacBook, which one would you like to see in an in-depth comparison against the M5? Let me know in the comments down below because I am planning on making a follow-up video to this one. I just don't know which one makes the most sense to focus on right now, but that is all I've got for you today. If you enjoyed this video or you found it useful, feel free to hit that like button. If you'd like to see more tech-related content or watch me airdrop ideas to myself to fuel your creative energy, please subscribe. Thank you so much for watching and I will see you in the next upload.